Right, um, I think, I don't think Konstantinos Svarsalinos is here, but he's loomed large over this conference and has given a lot of um, really excellent presentations. And one of the things he said in an earlier session was that it's not enough to do the science and the research, you have to translate it into policy and practice. And that's kind of my day job, because I'm a social scientist who does apply policy research um, and tries to talk to policymakers about evidence. And most of the studies that I do and have done for the last 15 years are with smokers who are trying to stop smoking and they're using different um, ways to do that. And I've done a lot of work, for example, in smoking, smoking pregnancy. But I would say that in the last 18 months um, to two years, uh, the main thing that people have asked me to talk about is harm reduction and electronic cigarettes. And I found it challenging and difficult, um, often, uh, because the environment that I operate in, in relation to electronic cigarettes in particular, but harm reduction as well, despite what Deborah has said, is often hostile. So what I'm going to try and do in this talk, and the people who don't necessarily agree with the arguments are not in this room, um, I'm going to try and show you what I think some of the key bits of evidence are about harm reduction that we can all be using internationally uh, to make the case to consider this approach. And then I'll also highlight what I see as some of the challenges and questions and, and potential risks that we need to think about. We'll talk about the guidance that Deborah mentioned, which is UK specific, but I'll try and make it more generalizable. I'll talk about how it's been received, and, and then try and link up what we know about harm reduction generally, which we've heard about from Scandinavia in relation to snus and other areas, and e-cigarettes. And then talk about this idea of the end game, <coughs> the free future, which you hear about, and kind of exists a lot in my world. So how does harm reduction connect or not to that? You can form your own view. So we know harm reduction is aimed at those smokers in relation to tobacco who, for whatever reason, are not able or don't want to stop using tobacco or stop using nicotine. And Deborah already mentioned the guidance. So the background to this in relation to, uh, Deborah mentioned Beyond Smoking Kills, but we also had a Royal College of Physicians report in 20, uh, 2007. And then I chaired the committee that produced the tobacco harm reduction guidance. Deborah sat on it and others uh, that was published in June 2013. So this is what the guidance says. The only reason it says this is because in the UK, as in other countries, we have a, a free at the point of use service to support smokers to stop. It's part of our kind of armory of tobacco control measures. And we have most of the other tobacco control measures as some other countries do. In my view, you can really only introduce harm reduction in a convincing and comprehensive way if you have this other stuff already going on. So I think the low and middle income countries that we're talking about in the session this morning, and um, there's a bigger challenge there. But for, for UK smokers, and potentially for those in other countries, these are the types of things the guidance says. These are the options. If people want to stop smoking, they can do it in one step. We've got a whole system organized around that. Or they might not want to stop abruptly, so they cut down. And that's what lots of people do in practice before they stop. And they can do that with or without a nicotine-containing product. People just might want to smoke less, full stop and they can do that with the product or not. And then we've also got a group of people for us who are a priority, who are either forced to abstain, because they're in an institution, for example, or they want to stop temporarily for whatever reason. And the guidance speaks to them as well. In relation to nicotine-containing products, you know, time has passed since this was published, but this is what the NICE guidance says. It really only talks about, it talks about replacement, but it talks about licensed products, and these are pharmaceutical treatments for smoking. In relation to e-cigarettes, I think as many of you know, it says that they can't be recommended at the moment because they're not licensed as medicines. I'm gonna give you some examples later on of how we've sort of moved in, in relation to informal practice in that. And nicotine-containing products, um, licensed ones in the UK in this guidance, and you could extrapolate this to e-cigarettes, can be used either temporarily or indefinitely as a partial or complete substitute for tobacco. So here's what the guidance says about nicotine-containing products generally. And the first, this first statement is really important because we don't hear this in lots of other countries. And I've gone to talk about this in a number of other countries. There's reason to believe that lifetime use of licensed nicotine-containing products, and you could say nicotine-containing products, will be considerably less harmful than smoking. Now, you all know that, so you believe it. But there's lots of people who don't. And secondly, there's little direct evidence on the effectiveness, quality, and safety of nicotine-containing products, that's like e-cigarettes, that are not regulated. But the statement we keep using time and time again is they're expected to be less harmful than tobacco. 
And it's important that the public understands that, but not everybody does. We need to accept that, and we need to talk about it a lot and often. So here's what interests me. This is a slide from the Smoking Toolkit that you're familiar with from UCL that Robert West runs. So in the relation to the studies that I've been involved with over the last 15 years, they kind of involve those smokers who are trying to actively stop. And that's about 10 to 12% of the population on this slide in England in any given year. And then you'll see um, the, the proportion that are using e-cigarettes has particularly just cut down. But the, the red line at the top is people who are cutting down or trying to reduce their tobacco consumption. And that's anywhere between 50 and 57% between September 2009 and September 2013. And my perspective, certainly traditionally, less so now, is that that group of smokers are not really being offered or were not being offered much if they wanted to have any support or help to do that. And one of the reasons for that is the research evidence about cutting down tobacco consumption. So I guess one of the most common questions on a, in an interview is what are the health benefits of cutting down? So this is one slide from a systematic review and then I'll show you an example from one, one of our studies. And the sort of take home message, as most of you know, is that reducing tobacco consumption on its own doesn't necessarily have any health benefits. So this shows you the hazard ratio for mortality. If you go on the left hand side, that's reduced risk and on the right, uh, it's increased risk of death. And you'll see that in relation to cutting down, the only benefits really are around tobacco-related cancers, and they're still relatively small. So reducing your cigarette consumption doesn't necessarily have health benefits. Here's one of our studies in Scotland. About 5,000 smokers recruited in the 1970s, screened twice. In the second time, some people had cut down uh, and some people hadn't. And in that cohort, you didn't observe, and they were followed up um, to 2010, any real benefits in relation to reduction in mortality amongst those to reduce their cigarette consumption in both studies. Amongst very heavy smokers, we did see some benefits if they cut down a lot, but they were relatively small. So what everybody knows the reason for that, which is this idea of compensatory smoking, taking more in from each cigarette that you still consume when you reduce your consumption, and that's one explanation. But here's, for me, the crucial, really crucial bit of evidence that we used in the harm reduction guidance, and why we were able to promote, or one of the reasons why we were able to promote cutting down either full stop or cutting down to quit. And again, this is evidence from uh, UCL, from Robert and his team. And it shows you the proportion of smokers who report a previous quit attempt in the, in the past year. <coughs> so on this side, you have smokers who are not doing anything, they're not trying to quit or cut down, um, but the proportion that are reporting they have made some form of attempt in the past year. And that's about 18%. If you look at the other uh, side of the slide, that's the proportion of smokers who report that they're engaging in a smoking reduction, cutting down, or regular temporary abstinence, and they're using nicotine replacement therapy. 72% of that group made a quit attempt. Now, many of them were not intending to stop, but they tried to stop. So the argument there is if you use, and this is just NRT, if you use a licensed nicotine containing product to cut down, you're more likely to try and stop. <coughs> so you can argue that cutting down on its own while replacing the nicotine from the cigarettes through another product uh, is, a, is a, a, an approach that can be recommended because it may lead some people to stop, even if they didn't intend to in the first place. Now you could argue that electronic cigarettes will operate like NRT in this context. Now we don't have lots of studies to show us that yet, but that's a, a very reasonable hypothesis. Um, so that's the ground for, for advocating cutting down to quit. Um, right, that's it, huh? Okay, so the other, I'm gonna move on now. So that, that gives you some of the background in, in relation to the evidence around harm reduction and, and why I think it's useful to use it and to consider this broader approach. So what are the types of myths that many of us continually have to engage with and try and persuade policymakers and others that harm reduction is, a, uh, is an approach that can be advocated. Well, the first thing, as Deborah said, is just this general concern about nicotine. I think we've moved on in the UK over the last couple of years, but we still have a real problem. So this slide just shows you professionals who work in our stop smoking services. So these are people who've been trained to support smokers to quit. They should know about nicotine and they should know about smoking cessation. And what you saw, this is a, an article published in 2012, 
is that still a considerable proportion of advisors and managers felt that the long-term use of NRT was harmful to health, that the use of NRT for smoking reduction was harmful to health, and that use of NRT for smoking reduction will undermine cessation. So even in the professional group who you think would potentially understand these issues, uh, we didn't have um, clear understanding. So the first point is to deal with nicotine and, and ensure that people understand the difference between tobacco smoking and nicotine use. The second myth, we continue to debunk, and people have referred to this many times in this conference, is concerns about who's using nicotine, either nicotine replacement therapy or e-cigarettes if they're never smokers. And this uh, slide just shows your gain from the toolkit amongst 5,200 just 5,200 and some people, the proportion of never smokers who are either using e-cigarettes or using NRT, it's tiny. But that, that's something nobody's mentioned here. We do have never smokers who use nicotine replacement therapy for whatever reason. So we do that, it's not just e-cigarettes. The next issue, as Deborah said, is used by children. So these are my own kids, actually. And we were, um, this, this photograph was not taken um, in relation to e-cigarettes. But after we took the photograph, it actually looks like my daughter's purchasing an e-cigarette. That, that was not the intention of the photograph at the time we did something on point of sale. Anyway, but the, this is a, is a, is a huge <coughs> in the public health community. And we come up against it. I come up against it every single time I talk about this. You've all heard the evidence, we have very little evidence about non-smoking youth using e-cigarettes, but let's just uh, show you some new material. We published a review last month. We tried to look systematically at all the studies we have so far of youth uptake. They're really varied in their methods. We need a more consistent approach. Um, Deborah's already talked about the YouGov ASH survey. Except for one of Maciek's studies in Poland, ever use was reported by fewer than one in 10 children concentrated in young people who smoke. You've seen that one before. Here's a new one. This is a study from Wales, just published a few weeks ago. Probably not um, the best quality survey, and I'm sure that colleagues who conducted it would admit that. But if you look at the proportion, the blue bars are young, are children who've never smoked a cigarette. The red bars are smoking children. And the top of the graph, you can see whether they use cigarettes, e-cigarettes, more than once a week, more than, um, less than once a week, but more than once a month sometimes but not more than once a month and there are no never smoking children in those categories so we got that experimentation in the bottom amongst very small numbers you know i wait to see the data for increasing use but i'm not seeing it yet not substantially anyway um, so here's another area that no i haven't heard anybody at this meeting talk about i haven't been to all the sessions i think we do need to be talking about it and that's the marketing of electronic cigarettes now, you all have your own views on this. Countries vary in the extent to which they allow marketing. And in Europe, with the TPD, we'll have particular controls for um, nicotine-containing products that um, say they can support cessation and other e-cigarettes that will continue as consumer products in relation to restrictions on marketing. But what's happening at the moment, you know, and will happen for the next couple of years. So we did a systematic audit and content analysis of all marketing in the UK from May 2012 to June 2013. The reference is there if you're interested. And it's really extensive. And a lot of people are very worried about this. Now you can say it's just scaremongering, who cares? But if you look at the evidence on uh, energy dense foods, on alcohol and other products, if young people or adults are exposed to very significant amounts of marketing over a sustained period, over different types of media, it does affect consumption. You know, we need to acknowledge that there's good evidence. So I, my views have changed on this marketing, I have to say, and what I try and do now is talk about helpful and unhelpful marketing. So let's look at some of these ads, and you tell me what you think of them. So the first slide I'm going to show you, for me, is marketing that's aimed at the current smoker to encourage them to think about using e-cigarettes. So it talks about a satisfying alternative, a healthier habit, meeting cigarettes sort of head on, and then uh, you know, a promotion there um, making the switch. So, you know, fine, I can't see many problems with that. Then we kind of drift into a different sort of, sort of type of category where you've got you know, challenging the status quo. You've got, I can't remember this woman's name, even though who she is, it's very attractive. And then you've got, obviously, the, the issues around price, which are valid. So this is a different type of marketing. Um, does that have a role to play it's for you to decide? And then there's other marketing, and these are the kinds of images that I see a lot in presentations from particular colleagues. 
This is the Lily Allen video, um, which has been criticized as potentially being appealing to children, but it's certainly promoting the Elites product. I won't go through the details of all the others. But this is a particular type of marketing. And one quote from Clive in this conference, he said, it's really important, he said, the overwhelm, overwhelming importance of product appeal. Now, I can accept that for use, but I don't know whether we need this type of marketing in terms of the overwhelming importance of product appeal. It's for you to form your own views on that. So another question we're often asked is, what about the vapor? Um, uh, the uh, studies done by colleagues in the room and elsewhere that are lab-based and have looked at this issue. As you know, there's no current evidence of health harms from occasional exposure, but we need to be honest with a range of audiences that the effects of regular exposure over many years are unknown. And then the tricky issue, do we pr permit, um, do we support the use of electronic cigarettes in public places? So this is a very current issue in lots of countries. And the approach that we've taken, and this is really led by Ash with the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, our research centre and others, when a business is considering prohibiting the use of an electronic cigarette inside, we ask them to think about the questions about why they're doing that. Now lots of businesses have already decided to do it, health authorities have, etc. But we ask them to pause and think, what are the issues that you're trying to deal with? Um, what do you think you need to control? Do you have concerns about the possibility of harm from nicotine-containing products? Will restricting or prohibiting the use of nicotine-containing products support compliance with smoke-free policies? Or actually, does it not matter? And do you want your policy to help or improve people's health? And then we ask them questions about how do they deal with nicotine inhalators, for example? What's their policy on that inside? And very importantly for me, what about secure mental health facilities and people who want to use e-cigarette in that, those environments? In those groups where smoking prevalence is highest and they perhaps have um, you know, as much right as anybody else to stop smoking. So I think asking the questions and asking people really to pause and think is very important. So that's what we've been trying to do. And then just a couple more slides. I wanted to talk about working with health services and professionals who are trying to support smokers to stop if they choose to do so. What we're seeing in the UK is this slide just shows you the proportion who are using different forms of support, about 40% willpower alone. This is people trying to stop. One in four using an electronic cigarette, and one in five using nicotine replacement therapy bought over the counter, which is largely ineffective. And then you see those little yellow lines at the top? Those are the very small proportion of smokers in the UK and England who use our national free at the point of use treatment services, stop smoking services. <coughs> uh, less than 10% in Scotland, less than 7% in England. Um, the problem with this is these services have not responded to electronic cigarettes and the harm reduction guidance particularly well in all cases. And there's a number of products for that, uh, reasons for that. We've seen a downturn in smokers using the services, which uh, people attribute to the rise of electronic cigarettes. Um, and often challenging practice is really difficult, but views are changing, and we've got some really interesting pilots of harm reduction activity. I'll just show you this, because I think it can be applied and may well be happening in other jurisdictions. Um, this just shows you shifting attitudes in professionals who are involved with these services or other public health um, policies or services in the UK. From um, October 2013, about five or six months after the guidance, harm reduction guidance was published, to May 2014, um, and it just shows you some shifting attitudes. So whether nicotine products are a gateway to smoking, about 45% agreed in October 2013, down to 38% in May of this year. Will they delay quit attempt? 78% in October 2013, down to 65%. This may not seem like much to you, but you know, it's really hard to change these attitudes. It's really hard. Um, but it's happening through time, and there's some very encouraging examples. So just to give you one example, the local area, this is where Peter Hyatt works, and he's been involved in some of this, as has Hayden McRobbie, offering two treatment pathways, cutting down and then abrupt cessation, a structured program to reduce, um, then long-term use of NRT, and then offering electronic cigarettes alongside nicotine replacement therapy for both treatment pathways. What happens is that smokers get a, a starter pack free, and then they're encouraged to continue to buy the products themselves and find that helpful. And what we're saying now to services is that um, if you have somebody coming to speak to you who's using an electronic cigarette, you, can't, you cannot recommend a particular brand, 
but you shouldn't do anything necessarily to discourage people to, for con continuing to use them if that's what they choose to do, but also inform them about the other products we have that are available. And importantly, we know that if you use a nicotine-containing product to stop, you can increase your chances of success if you use what's called behavioral support. So why shouldn't e-cigarette users, if they want to, get that support as well to improve their chances of uh, uh, stop, to stop using combustible tobacco? And that's the kind of advice uh, and information we're trying to give now. So the final point I just wanted to make um, in relation to the types of discussions that are occurring in the public health community, I guess this is the really tricky issue, is what about the tobacco industry? Of course, many of you in the room know much more about um, the developments the industry is, is pursuing on electronic <coughs> cigarettes and other devices. And this is just one example from Nick Avengers. This isn't an e-cigarette. This is Vogue inhaled nicotine, um, which is showing promising results and has been going through the licensing process for the NHRA and I understand will be issued with a license very soon. There's also another product going through the NHRA appro approval process, also owned by British American Tobacco, which is likely to be approved soon. So the tricky issue for us is, these are products which will be available on prescription. So that means to many smokers in the UK, they will be free if they access the Stop Smoking Service, which is a publicly funded service. Now, through the Framework <coughs> Convention on Tobacco Control, Article 5.3 makes it very clear that health authorities and others who are involved in health policy issues shouldn't be engaging with the tobacco industry around those issues. So does the NHS make widely available um, a, a harm reduction product made by a tobacco company with public funds. That's a really tricky issue for, for uh, colleagues to, to consider and get their head around. Um, and that's not going to go away in the near future. Um, you know, we're, in, we're in challenging territory here. So my final thought is about the tobacco free future, which you know, a lot of uh, people working in, in tobacco policy talk about and, and internationally this is um, an area for discussion. We had a, a meeting in Copenhagen with different countries recently who set tobacco free targets. And in my own country in Scotland, the government has set a target to be tobacco free in 20 years. And this just shows you the trajectory. So what myself and others like Deborah and other colleagues have been arguing is that tobacco harm reduction if we're doing all the stuff we have already, we need something else. And tobacco harm reduction, to me, is a really important part of that jigsaw. But in order to continue to persuade policymakers about that, we need surveillance data, we need ongoing research, we need evidence to continually show them that this looks like a promising approach and it's making a difference. And to conclude, I'm just going to back, go back to something Peter Hayek said yesterday. He talked about Mike Russell's advice around tobacco harm reduction. He said that ideally it needs health authority support, favorable <laughs> tax regime, widely available products. Now I think with a national strategy, which other countries may consider, and electronic cigarettes, we're actually moving in that direction. And my hope is that we don't backtrack, we don't retreat from that, but we embrace it going forward to make a difference to actually get that line down uh, to where we want it to be. So thank you very much.